So we are live. So welcome everyone uh, and, and whoever's watching. Uh, this uh, panel discussion is, is really about the impact of COVID, the impact it's had on our work lives, our professional lives. I don't know about you, but our, our Thanksgiving last week was, was a, a pretty small affair in our homes with just the immediate family. And we had uh, extended family on, on a Zoom call uh, where we, we shared uh, a meal virtually. Um, and, and it was quite interesting, right? Uh, how that it actually worked kind of, but uh, certainly I missed the, the human connection of being with family uh, at the table, especially in, in a, at a meal like Thanksgiving. Um, so beyond the, the personal aspect of it, it's also had a huge and profound effect on the work that we do and the way that we work, the way we collaborate with our peers, uh, the way we collaborate during our meetings, uh, the way we plan and celebrate our successes. And so this, this panel discussion is really about, about that as well. You know, how has COVID impacted our ability to facilitate, to collaborate with uh, the people that we work with? Uh, I am Kumar Datatran and um, uh, myself and Jolly uh, are the uh, founders of uh, Agile Meridian, and we welcome you to this uh, live Facebook uh, uh, event. This is a new thing for us, so forgive any, uh, uh, and I tend to be a little long-winded, so people just cut me off if I'm going too long. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm going to hand it off, and, and we're going to do a quick intro of the panel. We've assembled an awesome panel of experts in the field of agile and facilitation. And so we should have a really stunning uh, discussion here on, on, um, on these topics. So we'll start off with, with Nathaniel. Okay, well, thank you, Kumar. Thank you for that introduction and for, uh, for organizing this get together today. Uh, so I'll try and keep it uh, brief, but just a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a, a collaborative leadership and um, team coach, and I'm based here in Antwerp, Belgium. Um, I have a background in software development, uh, and now I've also started to branch out and work with teams and leaders in other disciplines like circular design. Um, and I like facilitation so much that I actually was one of the founders of a community of practice, multidisciplinary community of practice of facilitators here mm -hmm. in, uh, in Belgium. That's great. Thank you, Nathaniel. How about Michael? Hello, everybody. Uh, Michael Jeber. Uh, I live in the Midwest here in the United States and near Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, I have been in the Agile space officially since about 2006, 2007. Um, been using Lean longer than there was the internet, so really didn't know that I was using Lean for a long time ago uh, prior to using it. And uh, these days, I do a lot with psychology and sociology in terms of working with teams, leaders, uh, members, a lot of different people. Uh, try to take lean, agile systems thinking, uh, modern change management, and really apply it towards the human aspect of what's going on, which has been really helpful. I've been into that for about five years, and it's really come to play over the last eight, nine months. Um, I used to say that I'd spend 60 to 70% of my time asking people or trying to convince people that being adaptable is valuable. And now I don't have to have those conversations anymore. So uh, that's pretty much what I do today. I work a lot with a lot of the business side of the value stream, a lot of leadership side of the value stream, pretty much all up and down the side. So happy to be here and thank you for, uh, for having me today. That's great. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Jolly. Hi, uh, Jolly Rajan. Uh, I'm one of the partners in Agile Meridian along with uh, Kumar. Uh, physically close to uh, Kumar, Arushi, and, and Patmini in the, in the DMV, the DC area. Um, uh, have been a coach for the last uh, 12 or 13 years, uh, helping uh, big companies, small companies in their path to agility. Uh, there is no one cookie cutter, cutter way to make this happen. So I've been very fortunate to be involved in a variety of companies, variety of environments, variety of um, uh, people, uh, very different approaches. And uh, yeah, I've been lucky enough to be involved with uh, people in this group um, on, the, on the screen. Everyone except Jaltori, I have worked closely uh, with uh, personally on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, yeah, happy to be in this group. Uh, welcome all. Thank you. I will hand it to Arushi. 
I am off mute, yes, because <laughs> I tend to do that. I have got multiple mutes and I just love to play with it. My name is Arushi. I, uh, I'm an Agile coach at Fannie Mae, probably one of the junior members of this group here. Um, I, my experience in Agile world goes back probably six, six maybe seven years. I've uh, been in the IT industry ever since I graduated as an electrical engineer. So you can tell I switch things and it's really fun. Uh, I've been excited about this field ever since I got into it. Um, I learn something every day and it, it just keeps me going. It's really exciting. Part of what I'm doing off late is uh, working in co as a product coach in coding dojos and so facilitation, uh, working with the team, coaching them, teaching them on a day-to-day -day basis is something that we've been doing since March. And so what I'm looking from this conversation is maybe some steps and maybe some tips I can share with what I have learned from my experience. Happy to be here. It's going to be exciting. I can already tell. And I shall pass it to Padlini, my favorite person in the whole wide world. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Arushi. Nice to see you here and nice to see you all. Hello, everyone. My name is Padmini Nidamolu, and I'm based in DMB area. I'm an enterprise agile coach working in Fannie Mae, um, along with Jolly Kumar and Arushi. Um, my, uh, my history with Agile goes back to 2006, 2007, to be precise, and um, been on various teams, worked in various industries, and worked with amazing people uh, whom I'm, uh, you know, I admire and learned a lot from. So uh, my primary role at my current company is to kind of have um, a systems thinking and end-to-end -end thinking, right, that view and how we can connect the dots and different teams and different portfolios. So we are running like one machine, the true business agility. And um, so that's the desired state. Um, obviously the current state is, is quite far from that. So I, I kind of work with uh, my fellow coaches to kind of you know, bring about that reality. I'm also uh, the co-founder of Lean and Agile, the one that you're seeing behind me. Uh, it's a community organization. It is geared towards women in Lean and Agile spaces, just to kind of raise the floor for each other and support each other and seek from each other in a psychologically safe space. Hopefully more women in leadership roles in future. Thank That's you. Great. And I'll pass it to Jill, Tore. Thank you. My name is uh, Kjell Tore Gudomsen. I live in Norway. I am the founder of a company called Humanize. And our mission is to unleash the potential of individuals, teams, leaders, and organizations. And I have been working with Agile since 2008 in various roles. And I'm privileged to be here, and I'm happy to be here today. Kumar, over to you. All right. Thanks, everyone. It was, uh, it was really good. So I'm going to throw out a, an easy question here, and maybe just a sort of a baselining question. Um, and the question is this, and, and anyone can answer. It's not directed to a person. Uh, hopefully this will generate some discussion. And the question is, what is facilitation? Who would like to take that? All right. <laughs> Always, right? <laughs> uh, so uh, there are many definitions, you know, to facilitation, but I think simply put, it is the ability of a person who is a facilitator, or it's the art of gaining consensus towards the common desired goal or common desired outcome. And it's the why of the people coming together and what of what they want to do together and where it's leading. So as long as that outcome is achieved and you're able to enable that, then that's facilitation. All right. That's a great definition. Any, anyone else want to add to it? Yeah, I, I maybe um, I'll try and, and, uh, and be additive. That's a great, uh, a great definition to start from. Um, maybe when I think of, uh, I, I put on my hat now as sort of someone who might do outside facilitation as well as internal facilitation in an organization um, to add some aspects of what does the facilitator do or, or what sort of their stance. And so maybe uh, one of the things that I would add on is that I think of someone who is, when I talk about facilitation and the facilitator, um, who's neutral on the contents and who is also, um, someone that is acceptable to the group, right? That they're accepting that this person's going to come together to help them in this, in this uh, process. Thank so those are maybe two things. Yeah. 
Hi, Tony. Hi. How are you? How are you? Hi, everybody. <laughs> so, so anyone out? We, we just were. Our first question is the definition of facilitation, Tony. And anyone else want to add anything to that? I think those. I think that's a good. That's a good summary. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Um, if I if I may just add, you know, um, my thoughts to it. Uh, and, and that is just that facilitation is the core of so much of what we do every day and all the time. You know, even if it's a conversation with, between just two people, it's, it's facilitating that conversation to that common outcome that what, what for many, what you were saying, right? So it's the what that you're trying to get out of the, the conversation that you're having and facilitating to that common understanding that you desire and maybe some action that, that spawns from it. I mean, not every conversation is transactional in nature. However, facilitation skills are so important in, in every conversation that we have, right? Being open, being, you know, having a listening stance and, and all that stuff is it's so important in, in, uh, in, in my experience and opinion. All right, so. And, and, and the best uh, uh, at, the, at the art of facilitation uh, probably tend to do it without it being obvious that it is going through a structured methodical way of uh, having an interaction, any interaction, right? That's right. And, and, and they, they, they do it in a way that, is, that doesn't seem very intrusive and uh, not, not uh, and, and helping each other um, in, in, in making that conversation happen. That's right. So before we go on to the next question, Tony, so glad you can make it. Thank uh, you. Could Sorry you I'm late, everybody. That's mm -hmm. fine. That's no problem. Can you introduce yourself to the group? Yeah. Hey, my name is Tony Lewis. Um, and um, Kumar and I go way back. And I am a coach. And I work mostly in the public health sector. I uh, work with people that are... Um, my organization is called the National Network of Public Health Institutes, and that's my full-time day job. Um, and I work with people that are in teams that are cross-sector, different, different groups that are leading health initiatives within a community. It's really kind of neat work, so. Great to have you here. Thank you. All right, so uh, from our, you know, moving on from the first question, so how has, how has COVID impacted your ability to facilitate. And let's see, um, I, might, I might pick on someone here. Okay, Michael. <laughs> yeah, it's kind, of a tie, it's kind of a tie into what uh, the definition that um, everybody here was providing. Um, you know, if you think about that, that ability to do that uh, seamlessly, you know, without, as Jolly said, you know, kind of, kind of naturally, right? Um, it, part of that is creating the environment to, to which all of this happens and it happens well. So big part of the facilitation aspect is creating an environment where people can participate freely. They can, there's a lot of visibility so that the participation can be fruitful and that, that, that a bit, those things can help drive alignment and consensus towards whatever the goal is of the facilitation effort, whatever that, you know, gathering around, whatever you're gathering around to do. Right. So I think what COVID did is it, it threw a wrench in people's traditional or patterned successful ways to build a facilitation environment, a, 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 a way to the, the, the environment around the talent, the people um, to, to be able to do that. Everybody has a lot of techniques that they've used and some of them are very transferable and some of them are, are, are better suited for different types of modalities. And I think that it really, it, it stressed as it did with everything else, it stressed people's um, the, the techniques and the approach that they use towards building the a facilitation environment to have effective facility to, to effectively facilitate whatever it is you're trying to achieve when the modality is just cut off or changed dramatically mm -hmm. or you're turned in a direction where some folks may have had experience with that. Um, some folks didn't think that it might have been productive um, and now they're finding that it might be it's pushed a lot of people to try things and to realize, wow, I can try it and not completely go off the side of the cliff. That's pretty cool. Um, and I think, it's, I think it's stretched a lot of things. I think it's made for people to be a lot more understanding as well around people who are creating efforts to facilitate. So you're creating an environment, you're in this challenging environment, 
you're trying new things, modalities uh, all, all are changing. And people that I've seen have been very, very, um, very thoughtful in terms of understanding and being, being realistic and understanding the challenges that the facilitators have to execute what they used to do in this, in this, new, in this new situation. Yeah, that's a great point, so all. Anyone else? Yeah, I, I would like just to add, I mean, all of the tools, uh, online tools that we had before, which was just an afterthought when we were all together, uh, or, or just an offline recording mechanism of some kind uh, have come to the forefront, right? I mean, all the tools. And, and to their credit, the tools have kind of stepped it up. The companies who make it, the companies who run it, they have kind of stepped it up and, and provided some things uh, that as facilitators, we all might have missed um, when we were uh, face-to-face. And, and they have stepped up over the last uh, year, uh, nine months, they have added functionality that have really helped us in many ways mm -hmm. that have sometimes broken through those technology barriers that seem to exist. And, and I thought I could never do um, as offline as a coach, uh, which uh, and this has worked out really well because this has expanded all our businesses to be worldwide and not where we could travel or be face to face, which is good for all of us. And I think um, this has been a blessing in disguise for uh, at least this respect. I'm not saying that you know many. This has been bad for a lot of people, uh, but from a from a future point of view, uh, from where this our business model is headed, this has worked out uh, in, in, in good ways. Yeah. Yeah. I love, I love what you said, Dolly, about the tools. I mean, you know about this, the whole the adoption of mural. I mean, you know, my gosh, you go back to March and you're, I, was, I was worried sick. I was like, oh my God, everything that we do in Dojo is so much face-to-face. -face. We, we talk about being in person. We talk about, you know, let's do it together with us and let me coach you with the whole team in the, in the setting and here I am having to say the whole team needs to go remote and we're going to do it remotely oh my god that was that was something I think it took us a month and what I realized in that time was we were slowing down you see when we were coaching teams and we were facilitating we were slowing down and we were worried that we're slowing down we're not sharing the material as with the speed as we used to right only come April, we learn to realize that it's okay to slow down. It's quality that matters, not the quantity. And I think um, our facilitation skills and the techniques that we use kind of um, evolved with the use of tools, like Jolly said. Um, and I think active listening became a bigger part of what we do. Um, um, also, you know, and, and I'm focusing on that a lot more now that I'm maturing into this field a lot more. I think. Um, nonverbal communication became a thing for me because I then started to like, you know, look for cues and signals from people when I'm teaching and coaching them, are they getting it, even if their videos are off. So, so a lot more of those, I think, I think there's been a lot more learning through this process. I want to hear some of the, the negatives. What, what, what have you uh, experienced in terms of the other side of, 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 this, uh, of this coin? Well, I think, um, so I, let, me, let me do one negative and then we'll, we'll probably go around, right? The first negative was uh, we can't turn our cameras on. Why? Because we live in a house and we've got kids and you know, there's just so much going on. And, you know, and that is why, welcome to my house. This is, you know, I, I live here, my kids are here. I'd make myself vulnerable and open enough for the kids to trust me so that they can adopt the same thing. It takes a while, it takes time, but it, I think it's, it's it has helped me immensely. So a negative is I can't turn my camera on. Um, and the way we are trying to turn that into positive is, is make ourselves open, right? And, and develop that trust in the teams. So I'll, I'll start with one and we'll let's go around because I think I'm pretty sure there's so many more. Right. Well, <clears throat> if it's all right, Kumar, I would actually kind of go back to something that's uh, based on what Arushi and, uh, and Michael and Jolly were sharing before because prompted for me to think about as, as um, I guess a positive in a way of all of this, another thing that I had, and then I can give you some negatives if you want as well, but um, was just that I think one of the challenges, I'm not sure if uh, the rest of the esteemed panel has had this experience or not, but I, I think that an aspect of facilitation, if it's done well, is that sometimes it's hard to get people to understand who are new to it, 
to understand sort of the what goes into it because if things go swimmingly well you're just like that was a great workshop I've, you know, I don't know what the magic was, but it's it's like being an audience member in a in a theater, and there's a great play that's going on. You're like, wow, that was that was fantastic. You don't mm-hmm. realize all of the people that make sure the lights are there, that our people know where to stand on their marks, so that the, the the performance comes off successfully. So it's imperfect, but that's a metaphor um, that that I think of uh, when I think about facilitation and being a facilitator. And so what the reflection for me was from your conversation was that this is really interesting is that um, in some ways, maybe it is exposing this being forced to be apart from each other uh, physically is forcing a bit of exposure of the craft and thinking about what goes into this and how do I, I can't be in their room. So how do I pick up on body language to make sure, you know, did that land? Do people understand the instructions for this part of the workshop and so forth? Um, so I, I leave it on a high note for there. Cause I know maybe you want to explore some of the challenges too, but I just wanted to share that. Cause I thought that was really, uh, a new insight for, for me from, from what you all shared. Yeah, that's a really good insight. And, and it's, it's so true that as a, as a, as a facilitator, having to facilitate anything in, in this type of an environment, it really stresses this, uh, what you know, or what you think, you know, about facilitation and really pushes the boundaries of what you're willing to try. Um, and um, not just for, for the individual facilitating, but also the people that are, that are in that meeting, that training, that workshop, that whatever, right? Um, and and, and it, takes, it takes quite a bit of preparation to pull it off and do it well, to, to your point. All right, uh, anyone else? Uh, Jill Tor, Tony, you're, you're muted, uh, Jill Tor. In a way, COVID-19 has been, has provided businesses with an opportunity actually to experiment with new ways of people working together. And you have mentioned already tools like Miro and Mural. Um, and because of them, there's been a need for, for someone to understand which template to use when mm-hmm. and to create new ones and to facilitate these new t- meeting types uh, in a good way. Um, so I think people like it and I don't yeah. think they want to go back to the old ways uh, of boring meetings, yeah. but on the other side, people are now being online so much that it may be more challenging for a facilitator to, to take care of the people so that they are engaged and also keep the energy levels up and also to, to, to see people, hear them and respect them and all the human side of things. For example, how do you take care of psychological safety and things like that? And how do you make uh, the meetings fun, for example? Yeah, good, good points. Um, yeah, anyone else? To that. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, to the, I just wanted to add one more thing. Um, <laughs> the way I work with teams, it's, it's usually a six week cycle, right? So for a whole six week, I have one team with me. And so to your point, um, it does become challenging because they'll probably listen to you in the first week because it's exciting. It's a new thing. And then goes the second week, comes the third, and you're like, oh, <laughs> again, Urushi, that's not fair. You know, and then, and then you start to get into that cycle of, okay, I'm there, but I'm not really there. Or maybe I'm taking care of the child and I'm, I'm really doing multitasking, answering another call, what have you. That is where I think, um, you know, my and that is probably why I started to research more on active listening and, and nonverbal communication to get get under the um, understanding of, you know, when they're saying stuff, how are they signaling it to me? What are they saying? Really? Are they getting it? Just wanted to add that. Yeah, I think one thing, too, that Nathaniel said, I think, Kamar, you mentioned it as well, was it, it takes more effort. Um, you know, when you're on site, if you've if you've going in and you're working with a group and you know, building the rapport and using um, big and visual tool facilitation is very simple. You can literally walk in with a, a whiteboard marker and some stickies and, and you're off and running. Um, and it, it can be very, very, even very little setup needed, very little effort needed for the facilitator and, and not a whole lot of extra added setup or, or needed knowledge from the participants, right? And I think it just people, 
to, to your point, they don't realize the effort that it takes. I, I was noticing that I wasn't planning in enough time to, to get prepared to do the things that I would do on site mm-hmm. for utilizing. And, and the tools have come along. They've, they've made it more, made the experience to be more like it was certainly the eight month, more so than eight months ago than it, than it used to be versus being distributed. So the, the gap is closing. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of effort, a lot of planning that goes into it, which essentially means you're going slower to your point, uh, Arushi, that you are going slower, but there's value in that. And you have to realize the modality requires it, frankly, at least at this point in time. And as we get better and as things evolve, that it will take less time, but, and as get more people do this for longer, it'll be more familiar to them as well. But there is a lot of investment in time to be ready and to facilitate well and to have it be successful and to keep it fresh yeah. to, to gel towards. You nailed it, uh, Michael, right? You know, I think we often underestimate what it takes to facilitate a, a remote meeting or a remote mm-hmm. consensus even. And I just came out of a meeting where people were talking over each other and these are all, you know, true agilists, right? And it's, it's not probably out of, you know, intention to or intending to interrupt the other person, but it's the anxiety of getting your point across and the anxiety of being heard. And you brought up a good point about tools. And and what we are observing more and more is that these communication tools that are out there, right? Miro, Mural or whatever, I think they're not always adequate for um, high bandwidth or informal interactions, right? Such as brainstorming or uh, side discussions or hallway conversations, studying the body language. I don't think they're equipped for that. So the human part of the interaction or perception is, is largely missing. And we coaches thrive on that, right? You know, it's, it's a psychology. It's, it's, it's capturing that, that um, emotions and more language. So that'll be a huge miss. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And, and to that, uh, I think the next question is for you, Padmini. How do you, uh, you talked about psychological safety as part of your in, in introduction for uh, women in Agile, lean in Agile. What do you do to encourage them, especially in times like this, right, where where most of us are disconnected from each other? I think I'm muted. You're good now. Um, I think the encouragement or or motivation. Um, now there is no silver bullet, right? Or there is no one uh, answer to it, but. I've observed that um, humility should be at the heart of leadership to kind of drive this motivation or engagement, right? And and, um, also I think to have a clear sense of long-term direction, even even in the face of a short-term uncertainty, because I think most teams are are, are anxious about their, um, their longevity in the role. Everybody is scrambling for, for that long-term vision because they want to be certain about um, their, their role and um, you know, how far they can take that with them. So I think it's, it's probably uh, having that long-term vision to compensate for many minor short-term challenges that you might have. And also I think uh, it is about having a systemic way of communicating your vision as a leader and uh, as an organization in general. And also, I think throwing in those um, recognitions, throwing in those mm-hmm. shout outs, throwing in those incentives, it doesn't have to be monetary, it doesn't have to be you know, any other comp, but just making them feel recognized will go a long way because many of us come to work more than a paycheck, right? It's, it's not just that mm-hmm. drives us. So kind of building that uh, shout out culture or recognition or appreciation culture uh, will take it a long way to make them motivated keep them motivated. Great points. Anyone else building psychological safety for your teams, your, just even a one-off meeting? How do you do that? I, I, I think one of the, one of the I, I'm not saying this is all positive, but one of the slightly positive offshoots of everyone being remote and us using all these tools is that if nothing else, a variety of opinions are being heard or at least seen, if not heard. <laughs> um, whereas in a, in a face-to-face, um, uh, one or two people dominating meetings that we almost always used to have, 
um, uh, some many opinions just get shut out. And in, a, in an environment where uh, we are relying more on tools and in some way grants uh, a degree of anonymity, uh, more opinions are, are, are being not voiced, I'm putting voiced in, in quotes, uh, but at least being, um, uh, being thrown out there. Uh, that doesn't mean that automatically psychological safety is achieved, uh, but at mm. least uh, we can talk about it. Um, if it is a good facilitator, um, they will find a way to at least talk about the issues being raised, which mm. otherwise may not have been raised. Yeah. Are there, sorry. I have one comment. Yeah. yeah, we're talking a lot about the facilitator, but what about the participants? Mm. Uh, and also we are, all, we are only talking about the conversations, but what, what is happening between the conversations? So for example, what does it mean to be a good participant? Can you actually train people to become good participants in these facilitated conversations? And also, if you as a facilitator, you see something in the meeting, then of course, you should probably talk to people between these conversations. So to train them to become better participants. What, what does it mean to be I a good participant? Go ahead, Kumar. I was just gonna just follow up. What does it mean to be a good <laughs> participant? Maybe it's, at least it's rooted in the values, for example, that uh, the, the company, the department or the team is having. That's the basis. Mm -hmm. And also I think it, it, is, it is very much um, going along with the facilitator, right? I think everybody in that room or in that meeting should have the same goal, right? Coming out with a consensus or a desired outcome and uh, not talk over each other. So whatever the facilitator is watching out for, the participant is also watching out for. I don't think it's, it's, it's largely different or distinct from, from uh, what facilitator is trying to achieve. Yeah. So, uh, I, I think it's, it's pretty much a similar mindset. Yeah, and a lot. It's also trust in the system, right? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, go ahead. Oh, um, so it's it's also a little bit of trust in in this in the way things are working, uh, rather than uh, just being oh this is not going to work. Let's just see. Let's just experiment. Let's just test how this works and modify it if need be for the next time. But at least flow with the go with the flow for now and 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 make the best use of the circumstances available. Uh, that uh, I think is something that the, the participants can sign up for. Um, I have to make, but I, I, I do have to say, I am a facilitator in probably 75% of the meetings that I'm in. For the rest of the 25%, I have to make an active effort to be a participant. Uh, and 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 trust the trust the process that is laid out by the facilitator. Uh, in you know I'm in meetings with Kumar and uh, other members of our Agile Meridian team many times, and I have to trust Kumar or or whoever is running that meeting to to take that um, uh, forward and and be an active participant rather than uh, double guess every intent. <laughs> you know, uh, Arushi, I think you had something to get. But Jolly, I think, I think you hit the right point. Why are you trusting Kumar? There has to be something that Kumar is exhibiting that you're trusting him, right? So to Padmini's point, it is, it is, you know, facilitator is part of the team. Yeah. This goes back to psychological safety. If you're creating that psychological safety, if you're building a team with a common vision, yeah. your facilitator and your participant are going to be in sync no matter what you try. It's interesting. Some of the some of the things that actually worked very well when when we were on site in in face to face with folks still works pretty well in this environment too. And the the concept of not being able to really help others get ahas unless you can get an aha about the group you're working with, right? Getting to understand who they are. I'm working with three different companies right now, and I've probably got multiple teams in each company. None of my facilitated efforts are the same with any of these groups. There are common elements. There are, we started out from the same spots, but now they've all evolved and gone in different places. And, they, and, and that's because what we did early on is we set it up to say, in order to create that psychological safety, to get the commitment, to get engagement, all of those things, 
people will come and say, what's the best way to run this meeting? You say, well, okay, let's talk about a few kind of non-negotiables, some things about how to, how to good etiquette and some things like that. Outside of that, we really need to make this our own. It needs to match the persona of the group. It needs to match with the culture of the company. It needs to ma marry with the mission and why we're meeting and what it is we're doing. So the frequency, how many conversations we have in between, what, what, are, the, what, are, the, what are the protocols we want to build for ourselves that we will test and try and see and some will keep and give away. But eventually all those things should be, should they should operate and function differently. If these people went to different groups that I'm involved with, they would be like, wow, that's really different than us. Are they successful? Yeah, they are. They're really successful, but this is what fits them, right? So that, that I think being a good participant, a good facilitator is allowing that maturation process to take its natural course and becoming more of a guardrail than a guide and, and allowing that road to kind of go where, where it naturally goes. And most people now are feeling comfortable enough with the tools and with all the te technology they're using and have their environment set up well enough that it, it, it goes there pretty quickly now. I'm surprised compared to what it was before, like in March and April, groups tend to come to that leveling point a whole lot faster now I'm realizing than the newer groups I'm starting with just recently within the last month than the ones that it took us several months to get kind of our, our wheels churning to get going. But all of them are using a lot of the same elements, but they're, they're not operating the same way and they're all finding value in it. And I think that's what's important is making sure that they're finding and getting the value out of it that, they, that they're looking for with that. I wanna take this a, a slightly different direction. I'm gonna pose this question to Nathaniel. Um, and you know, since we are all distributed now with, we don't have a choice there, right? So. Are there skills that translate to asynchronous distributed work? Specific skills that translate to that type of work? I, I think there, I think there are. So I think that um, I think there are both skills, and I think there are also mindsets that translate from the work that we would do as a facilitator in a room, the same room with a group, and doing work distributed synchronously, but also asynchronously. Um, you know, so I just take one specific example, sort of a value or a mindset that, that I would advocate for facilitators. I try and body myself as curiosity, right? As something that if we have people who are disagreeing in the group is to be curious about what their, you know, why they have those differences of view and to try and help them explore that. So if we can see if we can come to some kind of uh, agreement, consensus to working together. I, I think that, that that value or that mindset works when you're together at the same time in the room. I think it works if you're doing a distributed call, but I think it also works if you're using, um, you know, a discussion board or some kind of other tool where you're talking through trying to make a decision on something and you make some kind of intervention to be curious about, sounds like we have a difference of opinion here. Can we dig down and, and try and understand this further? Yeah, that's great. What do you all think? Any follow up on that? Okay. All right. Well, next question. So we're all working <laughs> remotely in a distributed environment. Um, how, do, how, do, how do you all deal with the fatigue of working in this environment? And, and not just for yourselves, but also for the teams that you serve. I'm going to throw that to uh, Tony. We haven't you know, I think you have to build in some fun and some breaks. Those are kind of helpful, some humor. Um, so that's a great point because this is exhausting to be on Zoom so much, right? Yeah. Um, but, and I've seen people be really creative in the fun space too, which is kind of interesting for me. Like things like, adding music mm. to the beginning of, let's say, a, 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 you know, I don't know if all this is familiar to you guys, but, um, or having um, just like a little game or, you know, something fun. I've seen people do bingo, you know, so just, I mean, I think mural is fun. So getting people to do some kind of different ways of doing different tools, um, getting them to try something new listening to a video, 
reacting to a video. It's mm -hmm. like just making it more fun. I have a team that uh, meets pretty early in the morning. Very, uh, most of the team members are younger and they all have a, a lot of younger kids. And they have gotten into the pattern of in the mornings, their kids start out the meetings with them. They sit down, uh, they've, they, they, they're running in and out. One of their dynamics is like, look, in order to build team camaraderie, to get to know my teammates, let's get to know my teammates, right? If we've got this environment, let's not fight it. Let's just embrace it. And their kids come in and sit down. Uh, the, the, the manager of the team, uh, he is always finding, he's going out during the week and he's trying to find new backdrops for Mario Brothers or something else. And he's putting it up and, and, the, and the kids get on there every day. They're like, what's Dave going to have on there this morning, right? I mean, it's just to your point, it, it, it's like something to look forward to that's so simple, but they're actually getting to like know each other. Like I've got my background. I don't use the, the backdrops. I just have my stuff here. I had a guy have a reel to reel tape back there and a guy came up and goes, you're a musician. My gosh, you're probably from the eighties, right? Yeah. Yeah. You saw the reel to reel, right? And he started this whole conversation where we got to talking about getting to know each other on a, on a, on a more professionally, but on a more personal level. And it, it, it broke, it just made communicating with him very, very simple. It was very, very easy flow. And it's almost like something you do if you'd see somebody at your office and you walk into a meeting and they had a, they had a certain thing, right? They had a type of watch or they had something they had on them around them. And you go, oh, wait a minute. Those are really neat. Tell me about that. You get to see a little bit of the human uh, because we're so dehumanized with all of this technology. Um, anything you can do to get the humans back into this, I think is a value. And watching that team in the morning, it was always one of my most favorite meetings to go to because I couldn't wait to see what the kids would do and what Dave would come up with on his backdrop, right? <laughs> yeah, so well, uh, many Sorry, Avashi. Go, go for it. No, I was just saying that now I'm missing. I dropped my kids downstairs in the basement. I said, y'all are locked there. <laughs> 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 go ahead, Charlie. Um, uh, I was just going to add, many of the teams that I work with um, have uh, instituted happy hours or, uh, pretty consistently every week. Thursday evenings. And, and one of the teams, it was really funny. I was looking for that uh, prop that they sent me. Uh, they sent everyone in the team, uh, because nobody is at the site, um, everyone in the team, like a, a floaty, like you know something that you would put a drink on and, and be in the pool with. They said uh, the scrum master sent every one of the team members something by mail. And, and she, one of the coaches was in Canada and she spent ten dollars to send that floaty to Canada, uh, you know. Through, and 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 we were all having a drink in that uh, during the happy hour. It was it was just great fun environment. And and something something small that they did uh, was ending meetings five minutes before the top of the hour or the bottom of the hour. Right, that made such a huge difference. I mean, we didn't recognize it when it happened, but when every meeting started to be just 25 or 55 minutes, uh, it, it relaxed everyone before they came into the next one because everyone, and they were, they, those teams were very, uh, very um, strict about that timeline. I mean, 55, whatever it is, you know, we are calling time out, let's go to the next meeting. Uh, and that made a huge impact to the people who were participating and also the facilitators who are most of the time going from one meeting to the next. And I think yeah. talking of meetings, right? Uh, that's another huge contributor towards fatigue because yeah. every conversation, e even if it is, hey, how are you, turns into a meeting, right? Because you just don't know <laughs> if the other person you know, is engaged in other meetings. So we tend to kind of block and spam everybody with meetings. And one of the um, uh, theme that emerges from every employee survey that we had recently since this happened is um, just too many meetings. And we have had problem solving meetings to solve for that, by the way. <laughs> but um, essentially, one more thing that, that worked out really well for us is an afternoon free of meetings. We call it no meetings zone, right? And, uh, and to me, that's a huge blessing because you can really uh, take the time to just, you know, reflect and refresh and, and then do what you need to, to catch up your breath and, and your work. Uh, otherwise, it's, it's just eight hours of continuous madness and there's no time to really work, work. So yeah. I think that that might work well. You know, Pidmini, uh, I had a group I worked with prior to COVID uh, last year. Um, and they had folks in the Midwest, they had folks in New York and folks in DC. 
And what they, they kind of figured this out on their own. It wasn't anything that I educated them on, but they, they did that same type of thing where they, they said, look, we all have to collaborate as a team. We're even in different time zones, but what it is, they created a, 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 a like a three hour zone where, Hey, we're all online. We're all accessible. Right. And this, and we're all doing work collaboratively there. And then the other times were, were quiet times because they were thought workers. They, they created stuff. Right. So they needed that space. And it was uninterrupted. You're right. It was really nice because they put blocks where they said, okay, we're all interacting. And then a block where everybody can be really deep okay. into their thinking to, to create good quality material that they were generating. So, and it's interesting because they've carried it on. They, they, they didn't see when, when everything went remote, I actually reached out to him and said, is, how's it doing? He says, oh, we, we didn't, we didn't miss a beat. It's exactly the same way we were doing it before because we were a distributed team anyways. So mm. I think that's really, really valuable. That's great. So lots of lots of uh, really good tips um, um, that that we're talking about here in terms of making our meetings more productive. Certainly, ending meetings five minutes before the hour, maybe starting them five minutes after to get breaks. Um, introducing a, a more human element, like uh, the story that you were talking about, Michael, with bringing the kids in in the morning, which is awesome. I love that. Um, um, what what else comes to mind? Uh, you know, there's challenges, of course. I'll right? add one. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to, uh, uh, challenges, of course, it comes to mind, you know, where people, you know, due to a lack of psychological safety, they don't turn the cameras on or they don't have the mics on. You don't really know if they're engaged. How do you, how do you ensure that as a facilitator, you know, I guess the role of the participant is super important, right? That they are bought in, they're there for a purpose. Uh, too often, though, we go into meetings, at least my, my experience as, a, as an external facilitator or coach, we don't, we, we inherit whatever the behaviors are in, in the system that we're, we're placed into. So what do you do? What do you all do to ensure that there's engagement and participation in the meetings that you facilitate? Okay, I'll go. I think that Daniel and I are looking at each other. Who's going to go first? Uh, <laughs> no, I think the element of joke, I think I've become a better jokester now than I was before. I play around a lot. I use words and I think that kind of brings the communication. I'm, I'm a little light on when I'm coaching. That's one. Um, the other one I, I love, love, love is, you know, um, we are being taught. Let's just say be right back and I'm not going to ask you a question. You go. That's fine. Um, third thing I love to do is over communicate decisions. So when we talk about our goals and, and what is it that we're coming together to achieve, mm -hmm. I will continue to over communicate that. And any aha moment that we kind of realize, I tie, I tend to tie it back to the goals. And hence the reason we are slow a little bit, right? Cause you know, if I were to do a certain activity or a certain learning with the team in the, in the physical environment, which would take me a day here, it takes me at least two days, maybe two and a half days. But the aha is actually well tied back to the team's goals. And now I get the active engagement, right? Um, there are times when um, there is nothing. Everybody is on mute and basically you're hearing nothing. And um, I then go out and say, look, I'm actually going to school for ICF, the ACC class, and I'm okay with silence. So have fun at it. I'm going to be silent <laughs> for a minute, maybe 30 seconds, whatever. But it tends to work in, in the favor of somebody will unmute and somebody will talk. Um, so that generally tends to help me. But I love the fact that you're taking enough breaks, you're tying the aha moments to the goals, you are, you're, you're over communicating the decisions. I think those have helped me immensely. That's great. And I think, you know, I agree with you, right, Arushi, uh, you know, the silence, the awkward silence is so hard to um, kind of proliferate, especially if the videos are not on. You just don't know what's happening. It's a black box, right? Uh, and in, in, in a setting like this, where we are all looking at each other, at least, you know, we are smiling, we are kind of, uh, you know, thinking or contemplating, at least there is some body language that you're able to capture. I think, especially if the videos are off as a facilitator, I think it, it becomes imperative to kind of call out, right? Hey, you know, person A, what do you think? Person Z, what do you think? Just to kind of bring in that engagement, though it sounds forceful, but at least it calls for a little bit of engagement and mm -hmm. their attention towards it. Yeah. I forgot to add one more thing. Hydrate yourself as a facilitator. Trust mm. me, I have done that. And I, I've been, <laughs> the dojo runs from 10. Exactly, girl. It goes from 10 to four. If I am not hydrating myself, I am done with the day with kids on my head with a headache. 
Yeah. It's not fun at all. Especially <laughs> now that it's winter, so it's like really hard. dry. Actually, here. <laughs> yeah, look at this. That's yeah. what I do. I'm like, this is right here with me. That's my juice. <laughs> I, I, I want to add a couple of things to, to what Arushi and Padmini said, uh, which is uh, w w one, of the, one of the ways that I try to engage people uh, is, in, I mean, especially in like brainstorming sessions, is instead of brainstorming, let's, let's say brain write, because we are, we are using tools anyway. Right. I mean, we are using mural, mirror, whatever tools mm -hmm. we use. Uh, let's brain write so that at least more opinions and more thoughts come to the table. Right. Uh, that is one way. And another way I've been trying to get confirmation from the people, especially in like training situations where it's a lot of push and, and not enough engagement in all direction has been to use um, uh, quizzes to engage, to see how people participated, uh, especially like, I don't know whether you guys have seen Kahoot, Kahoot.it, great tool, uh, gamifies it a, really, uh, a little bit um, so that there is some level of competition between people, um, especially after they have seen it once, they know what's coming, uh, they are all trying to one-up each other, at least a few of them are, if not everybody. Uh, right. Some people just don't care. Uh, there are always those people. There's nothing much you can do. Uh, but for the people who have been paying attention, it's a really great way to gamify it and, and uh, improve interaction a little bit. No, uh, you don't have to use that tool, but some way of doing that, especially when it's a push session as a facilitator. That's great. What, one idea that I, that I would offer up that I think has a lot of great ideas uh, so far, but uh, one additional thing that I would add is uh, an invitation to think about movement. So to make a more engaging online session, how can you incorporate uh, movement of people? Because normally if you're in a room, you might at least get up and move around a little bit, put post-its on the wall, what have you. So are there things you can do, encourage people to do stretches? And you have them do some kind of individual brainstorming and write something and hold it up to the camera on a post-it, nice. but to actually incorporate the body and uh, some kind of physicality as well, even doing online sessions. That's awesome. That's awesome. And I have one, and I have one comment too. Uh, if there is low engagement and people expect the facilitator to, to run the whole show, maybe you can turn that on the head because the facilitator doesn't have to be the person dragging people around all the time. Yeah. Actually, as a facilitator, especially if you are a paid facilitator, you're expected to learn others to also become capable of facilitating meetings. Mm. So if you see people are disengaged time and time again, then you should try to distribute the responsibility. That's awesome. That's a great point. That's a great idea. All right, we're running uh, towards the end of our session. Any parting wisdom that you'd like to share with our audience on facilitation, human contact? Uh, I mean, I don't mean it that way, but <laughs> the the human element that's missing in our in our work lives and our even our personal lives in some cases. Any parting wisdom, parting thoughts that we haven't already talked about that you want to share? I was thinking about one thing when uh, I think it was uh, Michael who was talking about the tools and 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 working uh, and 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 the and the extra work that sometimes a facilitator have to do up front uh, the, before before going into some one of these sessions, whether we like it or not, this is here to stay. Uh, I, I I know you you hear all all around the industry um, the leaders. Um, and, and even the uh, employees saying that we are probably not gonna go back to the way this used to be, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and whether that is a, a three day from home, two day at work, <laughs> don't come back to work, <laughs> whatever that mode is, uh, this is this, in, in some ways this is here to stay. Uh, so as facilitators, one of the positive sides of this is that we come out with like templates and reusable stuff that we can take from uh, team to team or client to client uh, that, that, uh, that is going to stay with us for a long time, uh, which is the plus side of this. So even if there is upfront work, uh, we 
potentially could save some time down the line uh, because of the, all the tools and all the reusability that comes with it. So I think that is something that I am seeing benefit from personally. Uh, we created some, uh, working with a client, we created some uh, training material and um, uh, some engagement pieces that went along with it. And we reused that for like 20 teams by now. Right, mm. uh, so there is some benefit down the line uh, to creating all of this and the upfront work that comes along with it. Yeah, that's great. Anyone else? I mean, I, I would say I, I think we as coaches, we as facilitators, we should we should encourage everyone to um, kind of disengage at the end of the work day and try to maintain an appropriate work life balance. Mm -hmm. it, it is just mm -hmm. so important in these times. Mm -hmm. uh, that the, the boundaries are diminishing across work and home and family yeah. time and whatnot. So I think we need to remind them constantly. So, you know, they come back refreshed, they come back more engaged. Yep. That's a great And, and I think talking to leaders about that as well. I mean, I think what we have, it's, it, it, we have a, we have a responsibility in helping the, the talent at organizations and helping the, the organization's uh, sustainability to, to make sure that, that leaders are understanding it takes more effort to do the same thing. The quality is still there. It just takes a little more time. You've got to plan appropriately and you've got to remember that, yes, you may slow down a little bit to speed up a little bit later. It's going to be fine. But if you're, if people are, if you're getting, or if you're one of those that are emailing at eight o'clock at night, or you're doing things over the weekends, this isn't going to last very long for those folks. They're, they're not, the, the quality will go down and, and having sincere conversations around how do we help you help your talent create those environments that make this while we're here over the next year or year and a half or whatever it is. And to your point, Jolly, it's going to continue. And I think Siemens said all non-essentials are, are around the globe are not coming back. We're selling our buildings literally. Yeah. Um, so, but, but, you know, finding ways that as we come out of this, we'll want to re-inject, even if we aren't co-located anymore time together physically to, mm -hmm. to, to reignite the flame, to reignite the candle, to, to, to cement those bonds, to find ways, even if it's quarterly or just something like that, or once a month, something where we're getting together, preferably a little lighter weight, uh, not so heavy on the work, but build the bonds so that this time we do spend online is is as high value as it can be, is as low stress as it can be, uh, because it's going to take active maintenance and active monitoring and, 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 and polling and, and being with people and understanding and watching what's happening to make sure that that doesn't happen, because this is, this is new territory for a lot of people that we're heading into this winter, as everybody in the Northern Hemisphere, at least, is, is coming indoors. Um, it's going to get even more so, right? So, so be on the lookout for that and continue to reach out and up with leadership and your groups. And, you know, and this just not for us, but the people we work with, the, the, the yeah. talent in the buildings, right? And have them be, let's, I'll go with you. Let's make it comfortable. We need to make this real. Uh, you know, we need to get real for the other folks that aren't experiencing it. So, yeah, that's great. Any other thoughts, parting thoughts? I have a comment too. So there is an opportunity actually to use facilitated uh, conversations uh, as an instrument for people to grow. Mm. And, and one way to do that uh, is to make it possible for people to be their authentic self. We have, we have discussed this uh, by building an attitude of inclusive, inclusive awareness and of course, nurturing diversity of opinions as a facilitator being aware about these things. And how, how would you go about? Um, it's more okay. about the awareness, I think. You probably need some, some human understanding, some psychological understanding. So it's build, a building of emotional intelligence, a building of not, yeah. not just group awareness, but self-awareness is really, it's really, what, I think what you're saying is it's really understanding yourself to be, to be able to better serve the group that you're facilitating for. And to help the people you facilitate also to understand themselves. Right. Yeah, that's that's a good point. So it's a process. All right. So we're we're I, I, 
Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Tony. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I was just going to add. Well, first of all, you are an excellent facilitator, Kumar. Oh, thank you, Tony. And you did a great job in this session. Um, and I would just add, like, anytime you can collaborate with the participants, as you have done today. Um, in designing your session is, I think, really, really going to make your session facilitated learning much better. So that's a good point. So as much as, as, as you can uh, do these types of things together with the group that you're facilitating for is going to result in more participation to Joe Torres point, uh, a common shared understanding of what it, the goal is that you're trying to achieve as a group. Um, and, and everything else should just fall, fall right into place. Yeah. I agree with, with Tony. I, I think you've done a great job, Kumar. Thank, Thank you. you. Together, I think we learned a lot. Hopefully your audience will as well. Yeah, I, I hope so. And just uh, uh, just appreciate all of you taking the time to join in this conversation. It's, I think it's an important one. The tools are gonna to continue to proliferate, right? The, the innovation is out there. I mean, I, I cannot believe how, how much it's developed just in the year. I mean, I started using Miro Mural a year ago and they've really improved it. And there's so many more tools coming out. I will say that for my last facilitation class, we used a tool called Gather Town, which incorporates some semblance of movement. Yeah, it's virtual movement on a two-dimensional two pane, but it still was movement. People crave that. And even in the class, I try to incorporate physical movement where they actually got up and were putting stickies on, on a physical, uh, you know, on the walls in their room, wherever they were. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that, I think that as this space continues to evolve, um, uh, people are gonna evolve along with it. You know, people like to your, all of your points are more used to working remotely and are hopefully taking the time to recharge as you, as you said, Padmini, that just turn off the work and take time to really recharge for the next day, right? To connect with their humans in their homes um, and their families that may not be in their homes. So that's really super critically important that, that people take the time to do that so they can come to work again the next day, refreshed and bring their whole human selves. Um, because really it's, it's, that's what it's about, right? Being able to, uh, being a, being a full participant in the work that you do. Hopefully you enjoy your work enough to, to do that every day, day after day. And if you don't, then you should find something that you're really passionate about. But that's a topic for another panel discussion probably. Um, but with that, again, thank you all. Appreciate your time. And we'll see you next time for another discussion. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Nice to meet everybody. Bye. Bye. All right, so I will stop the recording.